asking once again that you would speak to your people, focus our minds as they should be focused, and help us to marvel at the God we adore, the King of kings. Fill our minds with Jesus and our hearts also. In fact, may our hearts overflow that our praise and worship would also be lively, vigorous, and filled with Christ. Lively and vigorous, not necessarily loud and contemporary, but lively and vigorous deep down in our own hearts and souls that rises to the surface and fills our worship with meaning. Oh, may we feel that tonight. May you point us to it. We love you. Once again, we want to say we love you and we pray your blessing upon this time, the preaching and the hearing in Jesus' name. Amen. The chapter that we read, the, the fourth chapter of Revelation, is a, a captivating chapter. It's an amazing chapter of the book. And we find the Apostle John has been invited into a thrilling encounter with the supernatural, a thrilling spiritual encounter. In verse 1, after this I looked and behold a door was opened in heaven and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And then he goes on and he he vividly describes the immersion into the Holy Spirit that was his experience at this moment. He vividly describes what he's seen, what he's been shown. And what he really does is unveil the perspective of heaven with regards to future events. We're not going to be looking at all of the symbolism in this chapter. That would take us forever. We will do at one point, I'm sure, because there's so much of it. But what John describes is what Heaven counts as important as heaven looks upon the future things, the future events of the world and of humanity. Verse 2, he said, I was in the spirit. Oh, hallelujah. He started off the letter by saying he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And so he's just been given this further experience of a deep spiritual blessing. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he was to look at, look upon like a, a jasper. And he goes on, and he describes what he sees. Our title tonight is Heaven's Perspective on Future Events. Because you see, what is true of the book of Revelation with regards to the future events that we would go on and, and read in all the subsequent chapters, what is true of this is true of all events everywhere at every time. Heaven has a perspective reflecting heaven's priority as Heaven gazes upon the future of the world and the future of humanity. But you see, the first thing that John sees 
And this is so very important for us. The first thing that John sees in heaven, the first thing to which his eyes are directed in this supernatural vision that he, he gets is God upon the throne. He tells us, immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne and he that sat upon the throne was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. He sees this throne in heaven. He sees God on the throne. And he sees the glory that surrounds the throne of God. This rainbow of God's glory surrounding the throne. It's like Ezekiel's vision in Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 26. This is what Ezekiel sees. This is the same one that Ezekiel saw. And he's still on the throne. That means he's always going to be on the throne. Look at the glory that surrounds him. He was like a precious stone. It says Jasper in the authorized version, but it could say a, a precious stone of, of many colors. Here is God radiating glory. Here is the glory all around him. We often acknowledge at our prayer meetings that God is still on the throne. And that's exactly true. The reason we acknowledge that God is still on the, th the throne is because he is still on the throne. What does God look like on the throne tonight? This is what he looks like. The lamb in the midst of the throne is surrounded by glory. He's shining with glory. We marvel at Jesus, don't we? Was on the throne, is on the throne, and forever will be on the throne. Jesus Christ, our God, our great and glorious God, King of kings, can never be dethroned. He can never lose that position. And for, th for that, we, we praise his holy name. We thank him. The Lord, it says in the Psalms, Psalm 103, verse 19, the Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens and his kingdom ruleth over all. Not simply when Isaiah saw him on the throne. Not simply when Ezekiel saw him on the throne. Not even simply as John is given this spiritual vision. But tonight, this is God tonight. And he is ours. And we are his. How marvelous is that for us tonight, for, for Christians as we live our lives, that the comfort 
that comes from knowing this. You know, whenever John prays this prayer at our prayer meetings, it lifts my heart because it's a reminder from God of the one who rules. Because you know as well as I do, when you look, at, you look at the world today, you think, well, you think man rules. You think anyone and anything but God. But this is God. On his throne, magnificent in glory, surrounded by glory. As much tonight as ever, or as he ever will. What comfort, what confidence we have. Not only for today, but for tomorrow. Uh, the one speaking to John says, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. In other words, throughout all these events, John, throughout all these events that I'm going to show you, God is on the throne. Even when what I show you frightens you, even when what I show you shocks you or causes you to take a deep breath, God is still on the throne and he's still surrounded by glory and he's still emitting glory in the midst of what you're going to see, John. Oh my goodness, doesn't that help us tonight? Doesn't that help us when we look into a future we don't know anything about? That no matter what happens, no matter what the future events are, God is on the throne. That God is surrounded in the midst of what it is we face. God is still glorious and he's still directing the affairs of men. Confidence for tomorrow, hallelujah. Confidence for tomorrow. How can we be confident? Someone may ask, how can you be confident about tomorrow? Because I know that tomorrow, this is still what God is. I know that tomorrow and the next day, he's on the throne and glory, glory, glory everywhere. Well, I'm glad that God directs the affairs of men. These foolish little human beings who think they control what's happening in the world, what's happening to the world. God is on the throne and we're told he turns the hearts of kings wherever he pleases, like rivers of water. That's what Proverbs tells us. God takes the heart of the king and he just turns it this way and he turns it that way. And the only one who's being honored and glorified in it all is Almighty God. Imagine the most powerful king reading Proverbs 21. 1, and ye have this man. Proverbs 21 and this powerful man this emperor or whatever he may be, hearing that God can make your heart like rivers of water. All human power just melts away. It flows away with the river of that particular water gone when God decides. 
At the moment, we've got all sorts of things going on in the world and all sorts of claims being made about the way in which the world is careering off course and heading for destruction. The world is heading for destruction, but it's not rearing off course. It's on course. God's course. God is in control of what's happening. Aren't you glad of that? We don't need to be afraid of what's coming because, you see, we belong to the God who controls it all. And his heart for us is such a great, full heart of love and grace and mercy that God's course for creation, it's not going to harm you and me. It's not going to take us out of the picture. We're going home to glory. Here he is. He's on, oh, I'm not saying we don't go through the tribulation. So if, you're, if, you're, if you believe we go through the tribulation, or uh, I'm not arguing with you. All I'm saying is it's not going to destroy us. Because if you believe we go through the tribulation, we're still going to go home to glory. Unscathed. If you believe we're not going to go through the tribulation, I'd love that to be true, by the way. I really would love that to be true. I don't want to go through the tribulation. I'd rather go straight home to my Father in heaven. But I know for sure I'm going home to my Father in heaven. And when I get home, this is what I'll see. I'll see him on the throne. I'll see the Lamb in the midst of the throne. And I'll see the glory. And I'll feel the glory. And I'll bathe in the glory. You see, the reason we don't have to fear is because he changes the times and the seasons. My goodness, it's all we seem to hear at the moment is that the seasons are changing. Climate is changing. Well, I don't think we can really, I'm not going to deny that anyway. I'm not going to deny that the climate is changing. But what I will say is that my heavenly Father, the God who is on the throne, surrounded in glory, he is the one who changes the seasons. We can have confidence in our God. He removes kings, we're told, and he sets up kings in Daniel 2.21. He raises them up and he pulls them down when it suits him. Oh, what a confidence we have. Election. America's going to get involved soon in all, all sorts of political gymnastics and uh, all sorts of skullduggery. And we see it happening. God puts them in place and God removes them when it suits him. Why am I talking about that? Why am I emphasizing that? Because I don't know about you. I want a future. I want Zion Baptist Church to look into the future and to go into the future. A future that we can't determine. But I want one, don't you? Unless the Lord comes back tonight, then I don't want one. Not on earth anyway. But don't you want to go into the future with Jesus Christ? Well, surely it is the most amazing thing to think that whatever comes upon us, whatever comes into my life, and yours as we go forward. God is directing the affairs of men. You're not comforted by that. Are you not lifted up in your heart? I know you are. Isn't it the most profound thing that you and I can relax, if that's the right word to use, relax in the glory and power of God? 
Because that same glory and that same power pours love and grace and mercy upon his people. You see, here is John on the Isle of Patmos. And he's on the Isle of Patmos because of his love for and his service for the Lord Jesus. We're told that in the first chapter, verse 9, that he speaks of being a partner with us in the tribulation, a partner in the trials, a partner in the, the persecution, in the suffering. So to me, it's really intriguing that this spiritual vision that John receives at a time of persecution for the church and for him, the first thing that he sees is God on the throne. John was a man, of course. So I'm sure being on the Isle of Patmos, John had his, had his moments we mustn't think the apostles were superhuman. They were human. I'm sure he had his moments where he's wondering. Isn't it marvelous that first of all, Jesus came to him at those moments and Jesus spoke with him at those moments. Isn't it marvelous that he was invited to come up to where he could see from heaven's perspective and he could see the things that were to come and he was shown first and foremost the glorious God upon his glorious throne, John's God. The one who had put his hand on John when John fell to the ground in Revelation 1 who said, don't be afraid. The one who appeared in all of his glory, John now sees the same one enthroned in glory. My word. This isn't a different Jesus from the Jesus we adore. This is the same Christ. And the one that we were thinking about a wee while ago, standing in the midst of us, this is him. Oh, that he would just lift us up and give us a vision of, of the future events and at the same time see him where he rightfully should be. That would take the fear away. That would take the, the doubt away. That would take the panic out of our hearts. We don't know what's coming. None of us know what's coming. None of us know what Christ is going to ask us to do. None of us know. We might have had a wee inkling and maybe some little hint has been dropped into your heart. Maybe you've been awakened to think, well, I know of to do this. I know of to do something. Isn't it good to hear that, that he's on the throne and that he is directing the affairs of men? He is, he's sitting with glory all around him, emanating glory from himself. He is the one who's put the little hint or thought in your heart. He is the one who's saying, watch this. Are you willing? Watch this. Will you go? Here we go. He is th this one. To look on is like a precious stone, so pure and perfect, so powerful. And so John is directed to the throne as of first priority. And so heaven's perspective on future events is to remind us that all of the time, God is in control. Of course, you know that here. You know that here. And when all these things were happening in your life or in the life of the church, 
when things were happening that were hard to understand or explain, God was on the throne like this, in absolute control. Zion, that's beautiful for us. Really beautiful. And when all the garbage has come into your life, God's been in control. He's never been different from this. He's never been different from this vision. And when we realize this, that God has been on the throne all the time, glory, 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 directing our affairs and the affairs of the church, we suddenly realize that all of our circumstances and all of our situations, far from being chaotic and beyond reason, have actually been infused with the glory of God. And every step has been directed from the throne of glory. Hallelujah, what a saviour. <laughs> we have a future, wonderful future. Either here or there, we have a future. The lamb is magnificent. But you notice that he doesn't just see God on the throne. He doesn't just see the glory of God. When heaven looks at future events, come up and I'll show you what's to happen after this. Not only is it filled with God's glory, not only is God controlling, but look, verse 8, and the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, full of eyes within, and here it is. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Who was and is and is to come. Look at verse 10. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne. The first thing John is shown is the throne of glory. Then he's shown the fact that as heaven looks at future events, what does heaven do? Worships God. Heaven worships. Some of these things that we will read as we, if we were to read on in Revelation, they're not pleasant. Some of these things are difficult. It would have been difficult for John to see had John not first been shown God on the throne and heaven worshipping. So even when these difficult things happen, heaven is worshipping. Marvelous. So my situation, your situation, not only is it touched by the glory of God, directed from the throne of glory, but our situations are filled with heaven's worship. Now, I, I know that there are people in here tonight whose pain has been real and deep. Grief has been piercing. But doesn't it help to hear that even at the depths of that, 
Heaven was worshipping. Because heaven realized whatever it is we face, God is in control. I wonder if we can worship. Join heaven in worship when things are painful, when things are bad. They never cease. Night and day they're worshiping God the one who controls every event, past, present, and future. Heaven's perspective on future events is that heaven will worship God even when events look difficult and hard. What a commitment that is. What a challenge that is to the people of God. That when things are hard for me, I need to, I need to worship God. I should be worshiping God. No, not that I need to worship God, but my heart should be overflowing with a desire to worship God because I know that whatever it is I'm passing through, firstly, I'm passing through. Secondly, God is leading me through. He's in it with me. Thirdly, I won't face anything. that escapes the glorious hand of God. And at every turn, he loves you. Worship. Lamb in the midst of the throne. Revelation chapter 5. Oh, excuse me. Verse 13. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders, down they go again. Chapter 7, verse 17. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. This is the reality of God tonight. This has always been. And the reason we can be filled with a desire to praise him when things are difficult, perhaps it is too difficult for us right at the core of what we're facing at that moment. But when we get the opportunity to glance back, we realize the lamb who is my shepherd led me through that. And he fed me. And the reason that I'm able to move on is because heaven's reality then is my reality now. He wipes away the tears from my eyes. I just love the Lord Jesus. Isn't that amazing? The Lamb rules. In Psalm 63, in the very first verse, <clears throat> O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee.
My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee. In a dry and thirsty land where no water is, to see thy power and thy glory so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. David is in the wilderness when he wrote those words or he wrote those words about being in the wilderness in a dry and thirsty land and his longing, his craving was for Almighty God that even in that difficult time he could see the glory of Almighty God. And what do you think David would do the moment he sees the glory of Almighty God in the wilderness? He would worship and he would praise. He's the songwriter, the hymn writer of Israel. So when John is given this vision of what's to come, the first thing heaven wants John to see is God on the throne in absolute control. The second thing he wants John to see is that the whole of heaven is worshipping all of the time. Shouldn't that characterize us as we make our way home to heaven? You see, we are citizens of heaven. And so if we are citizens of heaven, we should be displaying the characteristics of the citizens of heaven. And our hearts should be overflowing with praise and worship. We should be brought to that place where we cannot hold it in. Because that's what we're going to be doing for all eternity. Someone said, if you don't like worship here on earth, you've got no business going to glory. Because when we get home to glory, this is us. Hallelujah. Someone will say, oh, but we'll have to work. Oh, wished. We will have to work. But everything will be worship. Everything will be worship. Don't you hate it when you're on a roll and then somebody says, what about? We'll deal with that when we get home to glory. But I'll tell you this. We should be reflecting it now. The worship of heaven. It's what's called the now and the not yet of the kingdom. It's not yet. We're not there yet. But we belong. And so what we will experience in fullness when we get home to glory, we should be expressing and experiencing now in part as we make our way home. Oh, Zion, we need to be a praise, praising and worshipping church who recognizes that God is on the throne, all glorious and wonderful who recognize that our praise and worship is joining in with the 24-7 praise and worship of heaven. What a choir. You see, when we get home to glory, the choir is going to be magnificent. The harmonies are going to be sweet. You'll know of the pastor standing up there and then everybody else follows the, the one that can't sing. Because you see, the one who cannot sing will be singing with a perfect voice and will all harmonize beautifully because that's what heaven does. And so as we make our way home, we make our way home thanking God for Jesus Christ. Did you notice that the lamb is in the midst of the throne? In the midst of the glory of God, there is the lamb. In other words, he is central to everything. And so when we praise and worship God, we praise and worship God for Jesus and for all that the lamb has accomplished for us. 
Ah, but also for who the Lamb is. Not just for what he's done, marvelous though it is, but for who he actually is in himself. The Lamb is the King of Kings. The Lamb is sitting enthroned in all the glory of heaven with all the power and all the sovereignty. He is the one who's directing my life and your life and the life of this land. He is the one who's building his church so that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. How can the gates of hell prevail against the one who sits on the throne surrounded by glory, radiating glory, glory all of the time, every moment of the day? Heaven has no chance against such a, a church built by such a one. And that just kind of leads us into our final point that in verse 8 and 11, verse 8, the four beasts were worshipping, not resting. Towards the end of the verse, they were saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Verse 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord. It may sound obvious, but in addition to seeing the throne and hearing the worship of heaven, with regards to future events. We also are told that they were worshipping God. They were worshipping the Lord. Well, I, someone's maybe thinking, but you see, when we look at the future events of our lives and we go forward into those events and we worship God regardless and we, and we praise his name as heaven praises his name, it's his name that we're praising. It's him that we're praising. Do you remember when the, the, the kings or the, the magi made their way to Bethlehem and when they went into the stable with their gifts, what are we told there as Christ and Mary were there together. What are we told? We're told that these magi worshipped him. There is none other. Well, why are you telling us that? Of course we know that. But that should shape the way we live. That should shape the way we worship here. Our worship should always be Christ-centered. It shouldn't ever be man-centered, church-centered, but Christ-centered. It's quite deflating for me when some... Songs, old or new, actually are songs about ourselves. Me, 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 I, I, I. When really we should be singing about him, singing to him. It's right to thank him for what he's done for us. But oh my goodness, shouldn't we be lifting our hearts to God, lifting our hearts to, hearts to Christ and just telling him how glorious he is. Yes, he's done so much for us. But we worship Jesus first and foremost because he is the king of kings. And whether he had saved us or whether he hadn't, he was still due our worship because of who he is. All humanity 
or is God worship? Because he's God. Holy, glorious, pure and perfect. Creator. They don't worship him, of course. Only believers can worship God. Just a wee aside, anybody can sing God's praises. Anyone. Only the saint can worship. Because only the saint has that personal encounter, engagement on a regular basis with the lamb who is in the midst of the throne. You know, pop singers or opera singers, they sing all sorts of hymns to get a round of applause. Give me a pastor who can't sing a bit, but whose heart is crying out to Jesus Christ because I know Jesus Christ. Give me a congregation of crows and keep the nightingales if the nightingales don't know Christ, who he is in himself. Revelation 19 Verse 16 tells us that Jesus is the King of Kings. What a glorious picture we get in that passage in Revelation 19. We're told that he was at the beginning as the world was created. John 1. In the beginning was the word, oh hallelujah, that's our Jesus. That's our Christ. We worship him because he is holy, holy, holy. We worship him because he's worthy. Look as we close at John, or listen to the angel rather, in Revelation 22. As John was tempted, John was tempted to worship the messenger. You need to be careful of that, of course. That John was tempted to worship the messenger. And in chapter 22, verse 8, I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. The angel was just the messenger. Doesn't say that it was the angel of the Lord. It doesn't say that it was Christ. It was an angel, a messenger, giving John the vision. And he bowed down to worship him. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. Zion, that's what we do. We worship Christ. Oh, may we continue to worship Christ and Christ alone. May there be no... When we get to glory and we get into the choir, without any audition, hallelujah, we get into the choir and those who have gone before us of great reputation in Christ they will be standing shoulder to shoulder with those who have no reputation in Christ 
and we'll all be singing the same song and our voices will all sound equally beautiful and God will receive us all, whether you're C.H. Spurgeon or C.H. Beautiful, beautiful. What a, what a picture of the reality that in Christ Jesus, we are all one. Heaven's perspective on future events is to point us to the throne of God, to let us see that no matter what the events are, heaven worships. It's also to focus our minds and our attentions on him alone. Let everything fall to the ground except Jesus Christ, the lamb in the midst of the throne. Heavenly Father, as we bow to you tonight, we thank you for your love. We thank you for showing us the perspective of heaven regarding the events of our lives or the events that will affect the church. Thank you that you remain glorious forever. We've been singing holy forever, glorious forever. You are ours forever. And we thank you, Father, that we can enjoy your embrace forever. In Jesus' name. Amen.